Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi, and with us here is our dear friend and brother, Dr. David Wood, who has celebrated his birthday today, right here, you know, with us. So hopefully, you guys have some cake and uh, some, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, desserts and other things that for us to celebrate here with them. But today's topic, really, it's uh, it's intentional. It's in connection. Uh, with the resurrection. Obviously, today is Good Friday, and uh, we are going to celebrate the resurrection this Sunday. But we're taking an angle, uh, or at least uh, another look, at how Muslims and Islam uh, traditionally interpreted uh, the crucifixion of Christ. And today, as David is going to share with us, some Muslims are starting really to take a look at the crucifixion in the Quran uh, from a different angle, or at least the crucifixion, you know, the fact that it maybe it did happen and we have to really reinterpret things differently than the traditional conventional way. With that in mind, I want to invite, of course, our dear brother David Wood here to uh, uh, take it from here and elaborate on this topic. David, uh, welcome back, of course, and happy birthday, my brother. Oh, thanks. I actually stay up at night and sleep during the day. So I pretty much slept uh, throughout this. <laughs> I slept through the day. And that's why I just, uh, uh, that's why we're actually a couple minutes late. I just bolted through the door. I got up, posted a video, um, then had to bolt to the gym, then came back here, got here a couple minutes ago. And so we're good. Actually, oh, hang on. Uh, oh, aha. You don't even, you don't even know what, you don't even know what's going on, do you? Ha. I you don't. Don't even, no, the, the video I posted. So I woke up, I made a video real quick, posted it, then ran, had it, ran to the gym, then bolted back here to go live. Uh, but it was, uh, I posted a little fundraiser for a Christian woman in Africa. She had fallen into a relationship with a Muslim man and everything was going well until they had a son. And then the Muslim man did not want her to convert to Islam. Uh, because he didn't want any Christian influences on his son, she refused to convert, and he actually took her son and moved to India. Forged paper, forged papers, saying, um, uh, you know, to get him a passport and so on. Left Africa, went to uh, India, and she hasn't been able to get her her son back because uh, she has to actually go and appear in court in India to present everything. And she couldn't afford it, so I posted a, uh, I posted a, uh, um, a fundraiser, and it's cool. Just, just people have already more than doubled what what was needed. So it's a, anyway, that's why it was cool. I just glanced that at that right, awesome. glance that right as we we're starting. So which is, it's cool that people are giving more because I mean, you know, she's trying to estimate what she needs to go for her trip and legal fees and stuff like that. But I mean, she don't know what's going to happen when she gets there. She might have to be there a while or uh, might be drawn out or something. So anyway, that's cool. That's good news. Got that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you thank for doing that, brother. And, well, uh, yeah, mainly thanks to thank you to everyone who's uh, chipping in right now. So that's cool. All Very right. Good. All right. So now the crucifixion. Have you heard of this? Have you heard of this, El Fadi? Of course. So I grew up, uh, as you know, David, all of my life believing that it's a lie, never happened, that Jesus did not die, that someone else was made to look like him. And uh, even when you argue that, wait a minute, you know, it says that uh, peace be upon me the day I uh, was born, the day I died, the day I come back to life. Oh, yeah, that doesn't mean he died. It means he's going to die later in the future. And the list like this goes on and on and on. Yeah. And, um, and that is the standard, we'll call that the standard, it's not the standard Islamic narrative. And we'll abbreviate that standard Islamic narrative. We'll abbreviate that S I N. So we'll just call that sin for short, but, um, the standard Islamic narrative is yes, is that Allah just dis disguised someone else, made him look like Jesus. And then this other person was crucified in Jesus place. And Muslims tend to look at this as something positive, like justice is superior in Islam. And in ah, Christianity, um, Jesus dies on behalf of other people, and Allah would never allow that. Um, so what really happened is the, the most common view I heard for years was that Allah replaced Jesus with Judas, took Judas miraculously. Notice it's not like coincidence here or people just misunderstood. It's miraculous intervention where Allah actually 
takes someone else, in this case, Judas, disguises him miraculously so that he's identical to Jesus. And then the, the, the Romans crucify Judas, but they think that it's Jesus. Now, um, Muslims tend to think that this view or some other, some alternate version of uh, sub, what's called substitution theory, the idea that, that God substituted someone else in Jesus' place. Um, the uh, Muslims tend to think that one, that the Quran says this, and two, that their, their, their sources are just clear on this. And I have spent years reading the Quran in that exact way. In other words, if you hear all your life, whether you're Muslim or Christian, if you hear all your life that that's what Surah 4 verse 157 says, then when you actually go to Surah 4 verse 157 and you read, they killed him not, nor did they crucify him, but so it was made to appear to them. You, you're interpreting it in light of what you've heard, right? You're, you've, you've heard that this is referring to Allah disguising someone else, making him look like Jesus, and then Allah um, replace, and then this other person getting crucified. And well, we love to point this out, to point out what it, the problem this presents for Islam, because as, as you know, Jesus' death by crucifixion is considered a, an indisputable fact of history by historians. So uh, historical Jesus scholars and New Testament scholars, whether they are conservative Christian, liberal Christian, atheist, agnostic, Jewish, whatever they happen to be, they they agree that this is a fact of history. They said this is the this is the thing we know best about Jesus is that he was crucified because that that's the actual historical event. It'll, you know, historians, if if you're not a Christian, you're probably not as a historian going to grant that Jesus walked on water. Uh, or if you're an atheist, you're atheist historian, you're not going to grant that Jesus actually rose from the dead. But people across the spectrum um, agree that Jesus died by crucifixion. So if uh, someone comes along centuries later and says, actually, Jesus didn't die by crucifixion. Well, it sounds like this guy is uh, either, you know, just stupid or he has no clue what he's talking about. Or he, and as, from a Christian perspective, we'd be like, ah, that's a false prophet here. You got a false prophet on your hands because um, in the book of Acts, you see the disciples go out and the disciples Jesus taught all kinds of things during his during his earthly ministry. In the book of Acts, when the disciples go out and start preaching what the takeaway message was, the takeaway message was Jesus died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead, and now you need to accept him as Lord. And so it's it's death, resurrection, and deity, death, resurrection, and deity. And so uh, when when we're told that false prophets and false teachers are going to come and lead people away from this, and then we see someone like Muhammad come along and say, um, hey, you Christians, uh, I agree with you on all kinds of things. I agree with you that God exists, that God uh, sent prophets, that that God inspired your scriptures. I agree with you that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he's the Messiah. I agree that he performed all these miracles. I agree that he's coming back and he's going to play a role in judging and so on. So uh, Muhammad grants all of this. And then Muhammad says, oh, except these three little things that I that I can't grant. Uh, one, he didn't die on the cross. Two, he didn't rise from the dead. And three, he's not Lord. Now, if we can if we can get past that, then then we're good. And it's like, my goodness, you are you are the ultimate perfect example of exactly what we would expect from a false prophet. You are like the perfect ultimate false prophet. You're 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 granting everything else except the core of the gospel that we know false prophets are going to come and distort. So from a Christian perspective, we would look at Muhammad and say, my goodness, we've been waiting for you because you are like you are like the perfect example of a false prophet. Um, and so there is an inclination for even Christians to resist and push back a little bit when Muslims themselves start saying that Surah 4 verse 157 isn't actually denying the crucifixion. So. Um, people may not know this because they always hear one standard message, but there have always, there have always been Muslims with a minority interpretation. In other words, they're not interpreting it um, 
according to substitution theory. They have a, they have an alternative um, understanding. There have always been these most there are even entire sects of Islam that have a different view. But we're we're typically familiar with just the main the mainstream dominant uh, Sunni interpretation. But there have always been Muslims pointing out problems with substitution theory. Um, and some of their some of their greatest some of their greatest Quran commentators of all, like Al, Al Razi. That's that's I mean he's he's up there with Ibn Kathir as far as um, being uh, one one of their most respected commentators of all time. Al Razi points out in his commentary he do, he doesn't he doesn't say that something else actually happened, but he points out problems with the standard Islamic narrative that Jesus was disguised by Allah and Allah tricked people into believing that Jesus was crucified when he wasn't. Um, Al Razi points out that if this is correct, if this Muslim interpretation is correct, then it, it just wreaks havoc on everything. This means you can't trust what you see in front of your face. You can, I could be looking at you right now and saying, oh, that's al-Fadi. Well, no, according to the Quran, I mean, at least the, the common understanding of the Quran, I might be talking to, to vocab Malone right now. And Allah tricked Allah tricked me into thinking I'm talking to to Al Fadi by miraculously disguising you and so on. Al Razi points out like this would wreak havoc on um, in in Islamic law, Sharia. If if someone's going to be punished for a crime, you have to be able to identify the person, right? That's why they have rules about ah, you have to have four witnesses for this and so on. Well, guess what? You could have a million witnesses. And then your defense could be, well, no, I didn't do it. Allah tricked you into thinking that I did it because he miraculously disguised so-and-so. And so-and-so -and -so was the one who was actually murdering that person, not me. You all saw it. You all, it looked like me because Allah is trying to trick you. Don't, don't fall for that. It's like it just throws everything into, into, uh, into confusion and chaos. And uh, Al Razi even points out, like, how do you, how do you know about history in this, in this sense, right? If, if you're looking back at history, notice. You go back in history. History tells you Jesus died by crucifixion. But if you're saying that you don't, you don't know that it actually happened because Allah was tricking people. Well, how do you know anything about history? How do you know Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon? How do you know any of that stuff? Allah could just be tricking and deceiving you, and you have no basis. You have no basis for knowing when He's tricking and deceiving you. Uh, so this is just one big giant mess. And I have to say, He's right. But. Um, uh, did, did you want to do you want to jump in with anything before I? Uh... No, I mean it's it's everything you're raising. It, it's it's common sense. Yeah. I mean, like you stated, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, some rules apply to Jesus that they don't apply to others. Interpretations apply to the verse about Jesus's death that don't apply to uh, others, and uh, and the list can go on and on. But it's kind of funny. Also, you mentioned substitution. I mean, Islam is against this. Uh, uh, you know, a, a substitutionally atonement, and they don't like the idea that Jesus could die for someone else's sin. Yet what was God's uh, or Allah's solution? Bringing someone else to die in Jesus' place. Man, what a brilliant plan. Yeah, and, and what you just pointed out exactly is another um, example of what we would consider common sense that is rare to hear from Muslim scholars, but you do hear it as a minority position. So there, there's uh, Sheikh Imran Hossein, um, who he's a he's a scholar of Islamic understanding of the end times and so on. So he specializes in that area. But uh, there's a there's a there's there's a famous clip of him now just like warning Muslims and saying you you're actually you are actually going to stand before Allah at the judgment. You're going to tell him, oh no, Jesus wasn't Jesus wasn't crucified. You disguised someone else and made him look like Jesus. And therefore, this other person was punished for what Jesus did. He's like, you're going to stand before Allah and say that Allah made some other person get punished for something he didn't for something he didn't do. And you, you're going to and he he calls it. This is not my these are not my words, although I agree with him. But he calls he calls substitution theory pathetic nonsense. He keeps saying pathetic nonsense and warning Muslims. And then he he goes so far. He even says. And and we we Muslims generally accept this. He he calls them a brainwashed ummah. This is a Muslim scholar saying that Muslims have been brainwashed. Again, just to be clear, YouTube censors. This is not this is not us saying this. This is a Muslim scholar calling Muslims brainwashed for accepting this idea that Allah just tricked people into 
believing in Jesus' death by crucifixion. So we do see this from Muslim scholars. And then you have entire um, sects of Islam. So people are familiar with uh, Sunnis, Shias, and Sufis. Um, Shias actually break down into a couple groups, but uh, it's not the dominant group, but there's one of the subsets of Shia Muslims are the Ismailis. And they actually believe as a, as a group that Jesus was crucified. Then you have Ahmadis who are, who are often viewed as heretical. They have a different view. They have a different view, uh, namely that Jesus was nailed to a cross, but Allah miraculously sustained him. So Allah kept him alive, made people think that he died, but yeah, he was still alive. Yeah, he was still a, he was still alive, and so this is. I mean, you, you're familiar with. We, you, there used to be a, a regular swoon theory, which is just ah, Romans couldn't tell if someone died or not, right? <laughs> which is ridiculous. Um, there were master executioners, um, but the Ahmadis. The, it's actually a modified position. Uh, Nabil used to call it theistic swoon theory. It's theistic swoon theory or theistic apparent death theory because this isn't just, oh, he happened to survive. The reason the reason people don't maintain that anymore is because we know too much about crucifixion. We know the, the Romans were masterful uh, executioners and crucifixion was a very, very thorough process. They called that, they called just the scourging, just the scourging at the beginning where they would take a, a flagrum with uh, these uh, leather thongs and chunks of bone and metal and lash you with it. But that this is not like a, like a little whip or something like that. This actually wow. would, yeah, it would hit you and would the chunks of bone and metal would dig into your flesh and they would rip it out. This was because this is not just a, you know, a little punishment where we're going to beat you to teach you a lesson. They're preparing you. <clears throat> they're preparing you for crucifixion. And they don't want to they don't want to be sitting there wrestling with a guy for two hours trying to nail him to a cross if it happens to be some strong guy. So they want you they want you completely weakened. They want to weaken you. They want a bunch of your blood already drained out of you. So you're not fighting and kicking and screaming. They want you basically to where you're like, oh, my goodness, let's get this over with. And so it, they actually called just the scourging. They called that the half death because people would be half dead by the time they were done just with the beating. And then you had the crucifixion where they where they actually nail you to a cross. And then they would either leave you there until you just rot um, or, or birds come and start gobbling you up. Uh, or if they had to take you down, they they do some sort of death blow. They crush your skull or put a spear into you or something like that. Um, so they, they were... Th this isn't the sort of thing you just wake up from later on. And if you did, the, the, the problem with the, the traditional swoon theory that was pointed out is if Jesus somehow just fell asleep on the cross and then is taken down and then appears to his followers later, they would have never concluded, wow, he's the resurrected Lord of glory. It would have been, my goodness, get this guy some medical attention here because he would have been absolutely covered uh, in, 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 in wounds. And so uh, swoon theory, that was abandoned. But notice theistic swoon theory, at least here you can say, well, we're not saying he just happened to survive. We're saying God helped him. God helped him survive. And uh, that the disadvantage of theistic swoon theory is that, you know, Jesus still goes through the entire crucifixion process. So it sort of loses some of the advantage of substitution theory where Jesus doesn't go through, doesn't go through any of that. Um, so anyway, here, here's the point. Uh, I, for a very long time, have been reading Surah 4, verse 157, in light of substitution theory. So I, I've generally always said, I think I brought up an, an alternative uh, understanding in, in my debate with uh, Shabir on the resurrection years ago. But uh, I've, I've always, I've, I've always, you know, pretty much thought until the past few years that uh, it really, really is obviously substitution theory being promoted in the Quran. And then uh, it's just a matter of, actually listening to some of the alternative Muslim understandings of the Quran and seeing why they say that the Quran is actually saying something else, you start you start looking after a while and going, you know, you know maybe maybe they actually have a point here. Maybe maybe Allah is saying something different than what Muslim commentators have said. So should we uh should yeah, definitely. We... All of this is interesting. And, and it's, you know, brother, it shows that the fact that the Muslim commentators, like when you go to the Arabic, 
you'll see so many uh, opinions. They'll tell you that, that, that the scholars have deferred on the meaning of this word. And they start giving you one opinion after the other, after the other, after the other. And then, uh, you know, you look at the translations from Arabic to English. Also, it's in my humble view, it's deceptive. It does not really represent the exact Arabic word. But that indicates that there is a struggle. There is a tension that they're not able to resolve. And somehow they have to, you know, go with these different theories just to cause more chaos and confusion. Yeah. And there is um, there is a tremendous irony in all of this. And um, we'll we'll go ahead and look at some of the some of the Quran verses so that people, you know, whether whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim watching uh the main goal here would be to get everyone to understand why a Muslim might think that the Quran is saying something other than what Muslims think it says. And there are reasons. The, the, the tremendous irony here is, let me just read Surah 4, verse 157 for everyone, because there's a there's an amazing irony here. So Surah 4, Surah 4 verse 157, it says, and they're saying... Surely we have killed the Messiah, Isa, son of Miriam, the apostle of Allah. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it appeared to them like Isa. It appeared to them so, and that, that in added commentary, like Isa. And most surely those who differ therein are only in doubt about it. They have no knowledge respecting it, but only follow a conjecture, and they killed him not for sure. So, Surah 4, verse 157, if you just read that, if you just read Surah 4, verse 157 on its own, I am happy to grant that it sounds like it's denying Jesus' crucifixion and death. It says, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it appeared to them so. Um, so, if you just read that verse by itself, it really looks like, it, the Quran is denying Jesus' death and crucifixion. In fact, it looks indisputable from the perspective of that verse. When you read it in the immediate context, in other words, you read the surrounding verses, you realize that this passage in the Quran is not criticizing Christian beliefs. This passage in the Quran is criticizing Jewish claims uh, that involve unbelief, various things that Jews have done that uh, that the Quran is condemning. And among those are, they uh, spoke against Mary. They, they said something bad about Mary, usually interpreted as like they called her, they, you know, they said that she had an affair or something like that, or she was a prostitute, something like that. And then the Quran is responding to the claims of a certain group of Jews who were claiming that they had uh, that the reason they didn't believe in Jesus is because they've they've exposed him. And so they're mocking and saying, how we killed the Messiah, Jesus. And so they're 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 basically mocking. And then the Quran responds and says, no, you you didn't kill him or crucified him. And verse uh, 158 says, God raised him to himself. And so Muslims, uh, the typical Muslim in interpretation is, again, substitution theory. But once you read this in context and you realize the Quran is not responding to Christian beliefs, it's responding to Jews who are making fun of Jesus, then you there you might want to pause and say, maybe we need to take a closer look at this. Because here's the question. Is the Quran saying you, um, you claim that you killed him and you crucified him, but you're wrong. You didn't kill him or crucify him. Instead, Allah took someone else, disguised him, made him look like Jesus, and then tricked you all. Is the Quran saying that? Or is the Quran simply denying what you're claiming? Namely that you're saying, ha ha, we, we got this guy. We got him. We got him. We got him. We killed him. We crucify him. He's done. He's exposed. We don't need to believe in this guy. He's been exposed as a, as a deceiver by us doing this. And then Allah is saying, no, you didn't. Allah raised him up to himself. And in which case, he's not denying that this all happened. He's claiming that he had vindicated Jesus, that, that this death and crucifixion weren't the end. This wasn't the, the end. This didn't settle the matter. Instead, Allah raised him to himself. And so you're thinking of him as being, uh, you're thinking that responding to these this group of Jews, 
you're claiming that you have defeated Jesus, but you actually didn't. Allah raised him and vindicated him. And so that's the that's the question. But you get that just by looking at the immediate context. When you then go to other verses in the Quran, then you start saying that Allah might be saying something much different here because there are verses, there are lots of verses in the Quran, which if you read those verses first, and then you go to 4157, it starts to look like Allah is saying something very, very different from, uh, from crucifixion. So are you, uh, are you, are you familiar with, with some of these issues? Well, yes. I mean, I think I know where you're going with that. It's almost like you can say Allah is the one saying you have no right to brag about it because you didn't do it. In other yeah, words, yes. it has to do with me. Yes, 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 indeed. And and again, if you were just reading 4157 and someone came up and said, no, Allah is really saying this other thing. He's just saying you didn't do it. I did it. Or uh, don't claim responsibility as if you've done something because none of this happens without me. Or you're claiming that you've defeated Jesus, but you didn't because I've raised him. If someone came along and started reinterpreting what looks what looks like a clear verse. They killed him not nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. Uh, if you're just reading that verse and someone started to interpret it in some other way, you know, it would seem like it, you know, it seemed it would seem like a cop out. It seemed like, come on. It, I mean, it's obvious he's saying that Jesus didn't die and wasn't crucified. But when you go to certain other verses of the Quran, we can look at a couple, you can you can approach this verse completely differently. And I have to say, after after you know wrestling with this for for several years, uh, I, I'm definitely no longer convinced that the Quran is denying the crucifixion here. Everyone needs to keep in mind there's this is just one there's one verse. There is precisely one verse in the Quran that sounds like Jesus wasn't crucified. Everything else sounds like it's either not commenting on it or it sounds like he was crucified. Um, and so Muslims might think, ah, well, that's why we go to, you know, other Muslim sources like the hadiths and so on. There's no source that goes back to Muhammad where Muhammad is saying what this actually means. And the tafsir you go to, the, the commentaries Muslims go to, they are all over the place. They, unless they're quoting one another, they, they don't agree on almost anything about this story. The only common thread in most commentaries is some version of substitution theory but they don't agree on even the most basic uh, elements of the story beyond that. So you go to some of them and you find that Jesus doesn't want to be crucified. So when Allah reveals to him that he's about to be crucified, Jesus actually looks for a volunteer. Hey, can anyone else be crucified in my place? If so, I guarantee you paradise if you get crucified in my place. And then one of his followers, sure, I'll do it. So you have that version. You have the version where Allah transforms all of Jesus' disciples, everyone in the room, so that everyone looks like him, so that, you know, the people come in and they don't know, they don't know who's who. They don't know who's Jesus, so they just pick one and then someone else is crucified right. uh, as Jesus. And then, of course, you have the ones where, so those are like, uh, you, you have those which are like volunteer basis. That's the volunteer version of it, where Jesus is asking for a volunteer and someone volunteers. But then you have like the punishment variations where it's someone like Judas, uh, someone like, a, a a guard, someone who was a a guard over Jesus and was was uh, was abusing him, and so Allah took him and made him look like Jesus, so that this uh, this uh, guy who was abusing Jesus he gets crucified in his place. There's uh there are there are, there are variations where the 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 Jewish uh, guy who was walking in to capture Jesus, as soon as he walks in, Allah disguises him so that he looks like Jesus so that the rest think that, aha, we got Jesus when it's actually their own guy. I think there's one version where Pilate is the one where Pilate actually gets disguised as Jesus and Pilate is crucified in his place. So anyway, the point here is they are all over the place in the commentaries. They're, it's just one giant mess. So in the Quran, you've got one, you've got one verse that denies, that seems to deny the crucifixion. And you have no reliable commentary that can be said to go back to Muhammad's understanding. And notice this would seem to be a perfect example of a verse you would want to interpret very, very carefully in light of a lot of other factors. But for some reason, Muslims just want to say, nope, it's substitution theory. That's all there is to it. And don't look anywhere else in the Quran. 
and uh, so uh, sadly, we we kind of have to be the ones to say, well, let's look at the Quran because we know you're not going to hear. We know you're not going to hear this from true. from your normal sheikhs and imams. Uh, you you might heal it. You you might hear it if you talk to an Ismaili Muslim. You might hear it if you you might hear. Uh, a different interpretation from an Ahmadi, or you might hear a different interpretation from someone like Sheikh Imran Hossein. But generally, if you're just listening to your usual, typical Sunni Muslim commentators, um, you're not going to hear this. And so they have to hear it from us. So should we go through a couple verses to uh, show what we mean here? It's actually pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's actually pretty yeah, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. You just read a couple of other verses, and then you go to four one fifty seven. You go, oh, yeah, that 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 does kind of make sense to about what Allah could be could be saying here. And just to clarify, the Quran is just a bit confusing here. The Quran is just a bit confusing. It uses confusing language here, and I pointed out the irony earlier. The irony that I was referring to was in four one fifty seven. It sounds like it's saying that Jesus didn't die and wasn't crucified. And then it says the people are just in a state of conjecture based on this. They have no certain knowledge. And what's ironic about that is Muslims don't even agree on what the Quran is saying here. So who's in a state of confusion? Um, Muslims do not agree. Muslims can't figure out what the Quran is saying. They've had 14 centuries to figure out what actually happened. They can't figure out what happened. And they have they have no reliable source telling them what happened. And so they're in a state of confusion, whereas the Quran sounds like it's mocking people who believe that Jesus was crucified as if they don't, as if they have no knowledge when Muslims themselves can't figure out uh, what, what's going on here and they can't seem to agree on what actually, uh, on what actually happened. So I, I just recently had a discussion um, with a Muslim uh, a Muslim academic, uh, Har Harvard, Harvard educated Muslim academic, um, Dr. Khalil Andani, uh, about this. And this was, it was actually, uh, Cameron Bertuzzi on his channel. He set this up as a debate because he, he knew he had a Muslim coming on and, a and, a and a Christian coming on, but it turns out that, that Khalil agrees. Khalil agrees that Jesus was crucified. And so he interprets, he interprets for 157 in a different fashion. And so there are there are several directions you can go to get to a conclusion that the Quran isn't actually denying the crucifixion here. So we'll look at a we'll look at a couple. Now you're familiar, you're familiar with Sur Surah 3 verse 55 of the Quran, right? That's right. Yeah. So Surah 3 verse 55. I'll go ahead and read it and then I'll I'll ask you um about this. Um so Surah 3 verse 55. Uh, this is the Shakir translation, but it says, and when Allah said, O Isa, so Jesus, I'm going to terminate the period of your stay on earth and cause you to ascend to me and purify you of those who disbelieve and make those who follow you above those who disbelieve to the day of resurrection. Then to me shall be your return. So I will decide between you concerning that in which you differ. Now, that is. I go to this verse a lot when I'm teaching um, when I'm teaching Christians some things they need to know about Islam. This is one of the one of the most common verses I go to, not because of the beginning, which we're gonna, which is what I what I'll need your help looking at. Uh, I like to point out that second part where Jesus, where where Allah says to Jesus. I will make those who follow you. Now, this is the Yusuf Ali translation. I will make those who follow you superior to those who reject faith to the day of resurrection. So Allah is about to take Jesus away. And he tells him, he tells Jesus, um, don't worry about your followers. I'm going to take them. I'm going to protect them. I'm going to make your followers superior to those who don't believe in you to the day of resurrection. So Allah is guaranteeing his protection of Jesus' followers, which already presents a problem for Muslims because your average Muslim thinks, oh, you know, Allah took Jesus away. Then the apostle Paul came in, corrupted it, and then it was corrupted more at the Council of Nicaea. And Christianity has just been, you know, just been in shambles ever since Jesus was 
was uh, taken away. But wait a minute, Allah says he's going to protect Jesus' followers until the day of resurrection. So, I mean, day of resur last time I checked, day of resurrection still isn't here yet. So Allah is still protecting, is still protecting the followers of Jesus from from their message, you know, from from their understanding being corrupted or something like that. Like, what what do you actually mean that Allah is protecting them? Because right. it's protecting them from from like the unbelievers who are denying him. So what in the world is this? When you compare this with Surah 61, verse 14, where Allah claims that he aided the true followers of Jesus until they became uppermost over those who rejected Jesus, you can go, you don't have to go to me. Uh, you can go to the to Yusuf Ali's commentary. And he says that Surah 61, verse 14, which says that uh Allah helped the true followers of Jesus until they became uppermost. He says that's referring to Christianity permeating the Roman Empire, becoming dominant and powerful. But wait a minute. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Muslims, Muslims seem to think that um, that Christianity was corrupted, that there were originally Muslim followers of Jesus, but that was corrupted. And yet, according to their own God, Allah helped the true followers until they took over the Roman Empire. But wait a minute. Uh, at last time I checked, the, Christ, the version of Christianity that took over the Roman Empire was looked nothing like Islam. It was grounded in Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity. And so if those are the followers that, G, that, that, that Jesus had, that Allah helped, then Allah, according, do you see the problem here? It's like, did Allah help the wrong people? Muslims, yeah, yeah Allah says he's going to help the true followers, but the ones who actually became dominant were people who believed in his death, resurrection, and deity. So if there were originally Muslim followers of Jesus who didn't believe those things, we have no record that they even existed. And so how dominant were they? How is Allah protecting them until the day of resurrection? Well, we have no record that they even existed. How did they become uppermost when they didn't make it and they were and they were led astray? This is very strange. Yeah. And the interesting thing about, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, Surah 3, verse 55, when Allah says that I will basically uh, make your followers, in this case, or look at the uh, English at least, that I uh, will make uh, basically um, your followers, um, uh, technically speaking, more superior or at least um, causing them uh, to be protected until the day of resurrection. In Arabic, uh, the, the if if they intend, because some Muslims will say, wait a minute, no, no, no. Uh, after the uh, you know ascension of Christ, uh, Christians themselves divided into different groups. And then Islam came basically, and now this applies to Muhammad and the followers of Islam. That's not true because the Quran could have used a phrase or a word instead of saying until the day of resurrection, could say, uh, meaning uh, for a period of time. And then you would know, okay, well, I get, I guess it was only temporary. It wasn't like uh, until the day, until the end of the age. It's, this is almost like the Islamic version of the Great Commission, and I will be with you until the end of the age and Islam here is confirming it basically until the day of resurrection. Like you said, last we checked, it's not resurrection yet unless we missed it. So, Yeah. And the other, uh, th there's another uh, glaring problem in all of this, given the Muslim understanding, which uh, makes all of this look really, really strange and confusing and silly. And it's that um, you look at what Allah is saying here that he's going to protect Jesus' followers until the day of resurrection, especially when you compare that with Surah 61, verse 14, where Allah says he did help them until they became uppermost. And again, you look at a Muslim commentary like Yusuf Ali says that's referring to Christianity spreading and taking over the Roman Empire. We know what version of Christianity that was, that Allah was helping. And it's not it's not an, any sort of Islamic version of Christianity. And so they have problems here. But here's what's ironic in all of this. If Muslims want to reinterpret all of these passages, uh, if they want to reinterpret three one, I mean three fifty five and sixty one fourteen, and they still want to say that Christianity was corrupted by the Apostle Paul and at the Council of Nicaea and by Christians and so on. They're not even thinking about what they're saying and about what their actual position is. Because, uh, Al, if Allah 
keep, keep in mind. So Jesus, according to Islam, he comes and he goes around preaching. He goes around preaching Islam, according to Islam. Jesus is walking around saying, hey, everyone, believe in Allah. Believe in Allah. Just believe in Allah. Just submit to Allah. And then, not, and then according to the standard Islamic uh, position, um, Allah takes Jesus away, uh, disguises someone else. Someone else, someone else looks like Jesus. Someone else gets crucified, and then Jesus, even Jesus' followers, we know historically Jesus' followers were convinced that he died by crucifixion. It became it became one of the focal points of of their preaching. So we know that that uh, if 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 Jesus wasn't crucified. Pretty much everyone concluded that he was crucified. So here, here's here's what I'm saying to you, Al. According to most most Muslims, according to most Muslim scholars, Jesus wasn't crucified. It never happened. So we say, okay, then that's a corruption, right? It's Christianity was somehow corrupted. Someone corrupted Christian. If that's not what actually happened, and Jesus was just safe, and someone else looked looked like him, uh, but because of Allah. If the crucifixion didn't happen, and yet all our sources tell us that the crucifixion did happen, and that even Jesus' followers were convinced that he that he died on the cross, Muslims want to say Christianity was corrupted. We have to ask, where did Christians get that corrupted idea that Jesus died on the cross? Where did they get that from? Did they get that from the Apostle Paul, according to Islam? No. Did Christians come up with that theory at the Council of Nicaea? No, not according to Islam. According to Islam, the standard Islamic narrative, the reason Christianity was corrupted was because of Allah, not because of Paul, not because of not because of the Council of Nicaea, not because of any Christians there were. According to Islam, Allah is the one who made everyone think that Jesus died by crucifixion and thus led to belief that his death had this, you know, uh, important role in salvation and so on. But notice it's not, don't guys, why are you blaming the apostle Paul? Muslims should be saying shame on Allah for deceiving all these Christians, but they, uh, they don't do that. Exactly. And, and not only that, I mean, you just look at it from a logical standpoint, uh, the apostle Paul, uh, the book of acts uh, and uh, other sources did refer to the resurrection of Christ and the crucifixion of Christ and the gospel as a matter of fact. And it was within at least the first 20 years, give or take, of the ascension of our Lord. So there is no uh, a basically legend here. It's not a myth that is being mentioned. It's a matter of fact. On top of this, 10 of the apostles lost their life. Why in the world would they lose their life if they are concocting a lie and they are promoting a lie that never happened? Um, even if you say it still wasn't true, they saw something, they believed in it, and they lived and died for it. You know, So, so that, that in itself does not really work with logic because, okay, one of them was, uh, let's say, naive enough to die for it. Two, three, four, ten? My goodness. Yeah, and you're uh, that's actually a, a large part of why I became a Christian because I always I had always thought that you know Jesus followers their guy died and so they made up a story about him rising from dead rising from the dead to keep things going, and then I found out how these guys endured torture and persecution and imprisonment and death for preaching his resurrection, and I thought, I mean, how many people are going to die for something they know they made up? Um, I tried to think of anyone else in history that I could think of who just went out and died for something he knew he made up. And I couldn't think of anyone. There are plenty of people who die for a lie that they believe in. In other words, they get lied to and they believe it and they're ready to go out and die. But someone who just sits back and says, you know what, I'm going to make up a bunch of stuff and then go out and die for it. That doesn't, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Maybe. So like you just said, maybe you get one like crazy person who does it, but really just across the board, all of them are willing to die for something that they conspired and made up did not, did not make a lot of sense. Um, so I concluded that, okay, these guys really believed it. What could have caused that belief? And uh, the only thing that made sense was they actually saw him afterwards. Um, so anyway, those are some of the problems that arise in Surah 3, verse 55 of the Quran. But there's another issue here. 
Um, and so you're going to, you're going to have to take a look at this because, uh, I'm looking at translations right now. I'm looking at, I'm looking at Muslim translations and then I see some heretical Muslim translations. So these are Muslims who would be considered heretical. And then I'm looking at some Christian translations and I'm getting some very different translations of the beginning of this verse. So the Muslim translations, let me give a couple of examples, Pickthal. This is Surah 3, verse 55, for anyone who's just now tuning in. Surah 3, verse 55, Pickthal. And remember when Allah said, O Jesus, lo, I am gathering thee and causing thee to ascend unto me. So Pickthal says, Allah says, I'm gathering you and causing you to ascend. Yusuf Ali, behold, Allah said, O Jesus, I will take thee and raise thee to myself and clear thee of the falsehoods of those who blaspheme. So I will take thee and raise thee. So Pekthal says, I'm gathering you and causing you to ascend to me. Yusuf Ali says, I will take you and raise you to myself. Hilali Khan, uh, uh, Allah says, O Isa, I will take you and raise you to myself. So I'm taking you and I'm raising you to myself. Shakir, O Isa, I'm going to terminate the period of your stay on earth and cause you to ascend to me. Those are the, those are the stand, those are standard Muslim translations. Then we have some heretical ones. And so Sher Ali says, remember the time when Allah said, O Jesus, I will cause thee to die a natural death and will raise thee to myself. Now that's odd. You're, now it's saying that this is, I will cause you to die. The uh, Khalifa translation, thus God said, O Jesus, I am terminating your life, raising you to me and ridding you of the disbeliever. So terminating your life. And then we have some Christian translations that go way back. But uh, for example, Palmer, when God said, oh, Jesus, I will make you die and take you up again to me. So he he's whatever he's reading, he's reading, he's interpreting it as God saying that, that Jesus is going to die. You have Rodwell. Remember when God said, oh, Jesus, verily, I will cause you to die and will take you up to myself. And then Sale, when God said, oh, Jesus, verily, I will cause you to die and will take you up unto me. This is very strange. So you have Orthodox Muslims who are translating this as I'll gather you and then and then ra raise you or make you ascend. But you have heretical Muslims who are saying, no, Allah's going to going to end your life. He's he's you're going to die. And then the Christians are interpreting this as Allah's going to cause you to die. So what what are your thoughts on on uh the Arabic for this? Well, the Arabic is very clear. For instance, if we look at this particular verse, it says, If qala Allahu ya Isa inni mutawafika, mutawafika meaning will cause you to die. That's if you were to give me the word just by itself without putting it in any context, that will be the logical way to interpret it or translate it for you. So just just to be clear, because everyone, if if you don't listen to anything else we say right here, we're we're going to give you some some more examples of these problems. But we can actually go through these uh, uh, pretty quickly. Um, you're pointing out if you were to just read this verse, if you were to read this verse, and you weren't interpreting it, if you weren't going to Surah four verse one fifty saying Surah four verse one fifty seven and interpreting that as denying Jesus' death. And then coming here and interpreting that way. If you're saying if you just went to Surah 3 verse, if you as, a, as an Arabic speaker just went to Surah 3 verse 55 of the Quran and you had no idea what 4157 says and you just read this verse, you would read it as Allah is going to cause Jesus to die and, and take him up. Yes, I mean, uh, th that's the logical interpretation of it. I mean, the idea, oh, he caused them to sleep and everything else. I mean, it's, I mean, that's not the, gonna come to your mind. The first thing gonna come to your mind as Arab speaker, he caused them to die. That's the word, that's what it means. Muta wafika, you're saying is that's right. I will cause you to die. Right. And and isn't the Quran a book of clear explanations? <laughs> yeah, and, and that's really important. And and this uh came up. Um, I mean, uh um Khalil brought this up in our discussion. But notice, even if you just went with just this verse, if you just went with this verse, Allah says he's causing Jesus to die. He's causing Jesus to die. Allah says, before the crucifixion ever happens, 
Allah tells him, Jesus, guess what? Causing you to die, I'm going to raise you up. Now notice, if you if that's all you had to go on, Allah caused Jesus to die. If some Jews come along later and says, we killed him, just going with just going with 355, wouldn't you say, no, 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 Allah, about that. Uh, yeah, Allah did that through you. You are mere instruments. It's not you. None of this can happen without Allah. Allah's the one who did it. Allah's the one who ended his life. He may have used you as instruments, but Allah's the one who did it. You don't get to boast about things like that. So, in other words, uh, so you have that issue where it now it make it can make perfect sense just based on this verse. If Allah's saying he's the one who ended Jesus' life then Jews who are boasting saying they did it and they've they've sort of overpowered and exposed Jesus, then the response is, no, you, no, you didn't. Allah, Allah did that. Allah did that. And so notice it's basically what's happening in the Muslim translations is they're going to 4157. And instead of going to the rest of the Quran and figuring out how they should understand that passage, they first interpret the verse in light of later commentaries, which promote substitution theory. And they say, ah, the Quran in 4157 is promoting substitution theory. So Jesus never died. He was never crucified. Someone else. It happened to someone else. And then when they go to verses like 355, they have to, uh-oh, it says Jesus, it says Allah caused Jesus to die. We have to translate that in some other way. We have to translate it as Allah gathered him or took him or something like that. And we have to give it a, a different from the from the normal understanding of the verse to reconcile it with, with 4157. Whereas if they had just reversed the order of under, if they had started at the beginning of the Quran and read Surah 1, then Surah 2, then Surah 3, and read Surah 3, verse 55, and said, wait a minute, Allah says he's causing Jesus to die, and then he's going to He's going to cause him to ascend or raise him. If you read that first, and then you went to 4157, and you read 4157, and the Jews say, we killed him, you say, well, 350, 355 says that God caused him to die. So, oh, okay, maybe it's just, maybe he's saying you didn't kill him because Allah, Allah's the one who caused right. it. And yeah, that would so be it. Yeah, 4157 becomes a rebuke against the Jews for boasting and claiming something that they did not do. And uh, you're absolutely correct. In the Quran, Allah, at one point, he will tell his own uh, mujahideen, jihadis, you know, that you didn't kill anybody. I used you to kill people and fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, we just, uh, I mean, we, we can we can go ahead and wrap it up by giving uh, a few more verses that all support uh, this this alternate understanding of what the Quran is saying. And these verses actually give multiple ways, multiple different ways of understanding 4157 as not denying Jesus' death by crucifixion. In other words, there are multiple, there are multiple ways. We just pointed out one with Surah 3 verse 55. Um, but let me just give a couple more verses. I encourage everyone to write these down, read these verses carefully, along with Surah 4 verse 157 until you understand some of these alternative interpretations and why Muslims themselves could actually look at these verses and go, actually, I don't think the Quran is denying the crucifixion. Um, so I encourage everyone to learn these because, you know, it, it's this is a being able to point to the Quran and say, that's a ridiculous book because it denies the crucifixion. Um, Critics love doing that. If you're criticizing the Quran, you want to be able to say that the Quran is obviously wrong here and that the only way to, to justify it for Muslims is to call their God the horrible deceiver who starts false religions for no apparent reason. It's it's just it's beyond ridiculous, right? But at the same time, if that's not what the Quran is really saying, we need to let we need to let our Muslim friends know that they need to stop this. Yes, we'll have disagreements about the Trinity and about the deity of Christ and about atonement. But we shouldn't, if the Quran isn't actually denying Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, then we need to we need to let our Muslim friends know. So I'm just going to give a couple of verses. Uh, I'll probably read a couple of them, and then people can, can study these a little more carefully. So uh, we just read 355, 3145, so same chapter. Uh, Nor can a soul die except by Allah's leave, a term being fixed as by writing. I'll give a couple different translations of that. Uh, 3145, Pickthall, 
no soul can ever die except by Allah's leave and at a term appointed. So if you just look at verses like this, it's it's saying that Allah appoints the time when people die, and it can't happen unless Allah is doing it. And so if you were to just read verses like that and then go to 4157, and people are both saying, ha ha, we got Jesus, we exposed. No, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Nothing happens except for, for Allah's plan. So stop acting like you're the cause of all of this. Uh, three, so that's Surah 3, verse 145. Surah 3, verse 169. This, this goes in a completely different direction, but you can also just read Surah 3, verse 169, and then go to 4, 157. And here again, you'll get a completely different understanding of the verse. So this is a different... This is a different way of reading the verse. So I'll go through a couple tr couple quick quick translations here. Surah 3, verse 169. Think not of those who are slain in the way of Allah as dead. Nay, they are living. With their Lord they have provision. Uh, Yusuf Ali, think not of those who are slain in Allah's way as dead. Nay, they live, finding their sustenance in the presence of the Lord. So you have you have that verse. Hey, when someone dies from from serving Allah, don't don't think of that person as dead. Don't call that person dead. He's alive. He's with Allah, right? And you look at four one fifty seven. Ha ha! We killed Jesus, and Allah's saying, No, he no, you didn't. No, you didn't. He's with me. I raised him. Well, that that also fits perfectly. It's a completely different way of of understanding four one fifty seven, but that actually fits perfectly. If you're saying, ha ha, we killed him and crucified him, and, Allah, and, and you're taking that as he's dead, therefore we're done with him. And Allah's saying, he's not dead, he's alive. He's not, he's not on a cross, he's alive. Allah raised him. So, I mean, think about this. Someone gets slain in battle. You're, 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 you're fighting a war, your buddy gets killed in battle. And you say, oh no, my buddy's dead. Allah's response is, no, he's not. It's like, yes, they killed him. No, they didn't. He's with Allah. Very, very simple understanding of this verse. If Allah says, "Hey, when someone gets killed, don't don't call him dead. He's alive. He's alive with Allah." And the Jew and the Jews in in four one fifty seven are boasting, "Ha ha, we killed him." And Allah says, "No, you didn't. He's alive with me. I raised him." But that yeah. these these things line up perfectly. Absolutely, and I mean it, the Quran is talking about just regular people. I mean, I'm using Islamic uh, uh, thinking, of course, Islamic thoughts. Regular people, Allah is defending them and saying they're not dead. They're alive. Imagine a prophet now who is, according to Islamic thoughts, is even a higher grade, a higher uh, degree. So Allah is also saying, no, 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 don't call him dead. He's alive. Absolutely. And uh, and so th that's a different. Notice you could ignore everything else we said about 355 and so on. Just go to 3169. And read that and then go to 4157 and it makes perfect sense while not denying the crucifixion notice if 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 your buddy gets killed in battle and you say ah they killed my buddy and allah says don't say that he's alive you wouldn't conclude that the guy wasn't killed right you wouldn't say oh he actually wasn't killed or he he wasn't dead allah is saying think about this differently yes obviously the guy got his head chopped off he's you know he's biologically dead don't call him dead he's alive um, so it's very easy to understand 4157 um, in light of that. Uh, then you have these verses where Allah takes a person's soul. So Surah 6, verse 60, where Allah takes a person's soul and then returns it to him. So Surah 6, verse 6, and the Quran says that this is actually something in sleep, that you go to sleep and Allah takes your soul and then uh, can wakes you back up. But uh it says, "He it is who gathers you at night and knows that what you that what you commit uh, by day. Then he raises you again to life therein, that the term appointed you for you may be accomplished." So you have that, and then let me go down because there's another example. Uh, Surah thirty nine, verse forty two says, "It is Allah that takes the souls of men at death, and those that die not during their sleep." Those on whom he has passed the decree of death, he keeps back from returning to life. Now, the reason I bring this up is because this is Sheikh Imran Hussein's understanding of 4157. This says that Allah takes people's soul at death. And if it's appointed for you to die at that, to, to be really dead, then he keeps your soul. He doesn't return it. 
But it says if it's not appointed to die, he'll return it. He'll return your soul. He'll return your soul. So Sheikh Imran Hussein is just saying his position is, yes, they nailed Jesus to a cross. Then Allah took his soul from him. So it, it appears that, I mean, look, that would be biological death. And then they take Jesus down and then Allah restores his soul. And therefore, you didn't kill him because according to the Quran, if Allah re restores the soul, then you didn't, you, you're not actually dead. And so that's his understanding of this. Yes, Allah takes your soul. According to the Quran, you're only really dead if Allah doesn't restore your soul. But if Allah does restore your soul, Allah takes your soul and then restores it, you're, you're not dead. Even if you would be biologically dead to the people around you, if Allah restores it later on while you're in the while you're buried in the tomb, then you're not actually dead. And so you have uh, you have passages like that and uh, I think you referred to this a few minutes ago, but another very important one that's uh, that goes along with what we were saying earlier is 817. So everyone write down 817, very important. Um, this is talking about after a after a battle, Battle of Badr, people were going around, Muslims were going around bragging, ah, I killed 15 guys, ah, I killed 12 guys, ah, did you see how we killed those guys? And Allah says, it is not you who slew them. It was Allah. Give a couple translations. Hilali Khan, you killed them not, but Allah killed them. Shakir translation, so you did not slay them, but it was Allah who slew them. Now think about this, because you could just read Surah 8, verse 17 by itself. You could ignore everything else we said. You could just read Surah 8, verse 17, then go to 4, 157, and or 157 would make perfect sense right. without denying the crucifixion. So Surah 8, verse 17. Think about this. You went out, you went into, Muslims marched into battle. Muslims uh, won the battle. So these Muslims had, had killed some, killed a lot of the unbelievers. And then they brag, ha ha, I killed them. Notice, ha ha, I killed them. And Allah says, you didn't kill them. You didn't kill them. Allah killed them. A lot. Well, what are you talking about? I was the one standing there. I was the one who who stabbed my blade right into the guy's throat. What do you mean I didn't kill him? No, no, no. Allah was using you as an instrument to achieve his goals. Allah wanted this done. Allah simply used you and made you do these things. You think that it's you. You think that these are your decisions, but Allah is using you as an instrument. So notice what he says. You didn't kill him. What are you talking about? I put my sword right in it. You didn't do that. That was Allah. He was doing that through you. Stop taking credit. You're a mere instrument. You're a tool in his hand, right? If you just understand that, and then you go to 4157, and it's in your mind, wait a minute, I can kill someone, and it's not me. It's Allah doing it through me. And you you go to 4157, and you read, Jews say, ha ha, we killed him and crucified him. And Allah says, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. Wait a minute. If you read that after reading 817, you'd say, Allah is just telling you, you didn't do it. You were instruments. You didn't get some victory over Jesus. This was Allah accomplishing his goals. Allah was accomplishing his will. You don't get to brag about that. That was something Allah did. And you certainly don't get to use that as some sort of evidence against Jesus because it was Allah all along. So anyway, th these, are, these are some of the verses. These are some of the relevant verses that uh, obviously Christians who want to sort of raise these issues with their Muslim friends uh, might want to know, but also Muslims, Muslims. I, I mean, I, I, asked, I asked this question during uh, during my recent exchange with uh, Dr. Khalil Andani. Uh, I pointed out, uh, I asked the question, I said, if you're wrong about what the Quran is saying, do you want to know it? Like if you've been given a false interpretation by commentators, if you've been given a false understanding of what Allah says in his eternal speech, do you want to know it? I, I would think you would. I would think you would want to say, well, yes, if I've been, if I've been given a, a, a false interpretation, I want the correct interpretation. Well, notice, if you get a completely different understanding of 4157 by interpreting it with the Quran instead of with later commentators who completely contradict each other and are obviously making things up. So if you go to 4157 and say, what could this be saying? And you look at Surah 8, verse 17, Surah 3, verse 55, Surah 3, verse 169. If you look at these passages, you say, 
oh, this doesn't sound like the Quran is denying the crucifixion at all. This sounds like the Quran is simply telling Jews that you don't have the sort of ultimate, you don't, you didn't do what you thought you did. Allah was doing something and Allah was using you and Allah raised him. And so you didn't kill him. You didn't accomplish what you thought you were accomplishing. Perfectly straightforward understanding of 4157 just by looking at what the Quran says. And yet it just seems that very few Muslims are willing to do that. But I have to say the numbers are increasing because 15 years ago, it was rare to find a Muslim uh, who would say that the Quran is consistent with the crucifixion. Now there are there are far more, and it's good that we have scholars like uh, Sheikh Imran Hossein and uh, the uh, Ismaili uh, commentators and Western academics who are pointing this out. But uh, I don't know. It would be cool if we all sort of got past this and realized that Muslims, Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead. And that should be the thing that should be in the same category with belief in his virgin birth, belief in the miracles he performed. That's all that should be common ground between us if there is another way. And I just if there is another way of understanding 4157, I just have to say, even if you thought it was even if you thought. Well, it really looks like the Quran is denying the crucifixion. Once you take some of these other verses and 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 read them and understand them, then you should at least be open to the alternative understanding. But then when you factor in, wait a minute, the standard Islamic narrative portrays Allah as this horrible deceiver who led Jesus' followers, who according to the Quran were Muslims, he led them astray. He led them into false beliefs. He started he started Christianity, which according to Islam would be the largest false religion in history. Why would Allah do any of that? My question to you would be, why would you cling to that, to that understanding when it's perfectly simple and easy to not accuse Allah of starting Christianity and deceiving all these people and corrupting the religion of his own prophets? Why would you cling to the one that makes Allah this this bumbling deceiver who accidentally starts or accidentally or intentionally starts false religions. Why would you interpret it that way when you could just say, oh, well, if we just read this in the light of 817 and 355 and so on, then it, it's not denying the crucifixion at all. No problem. Amen. The miracle of reinterpretation in practice. That's pretty much what you're saying. And and, and the truth is this, you know, sure, there are verses, uh, a verse or two that talk about uh, the, the people who metaphorically go to sleep they're like dead but the context is very clear there you know that somebody's going to sleep but the ample evidence is that there is death involved and that the person who died is considered to be alive that Allah is involved in the action most of the time and sometimes the language itself the phraseology is almost identical to that was used in chapter uh, basically 4 157 so a Muslim who is hopefully sincerely searching for the truth, like you said, wouldn't you want to know it? Uh, at least go and compare. You know, uh, David gave you a list of verses, one after one after another. Go and see it for yourself. You don't have to listen to us. Go and compare it. I mean, after all, ask yourself this question. If the Quran is a book of clear explanations and detailed explanations, why is it taking us this much effort to try to explain it, if that's the case? Yeah, and uh, along with that, and this is this is really the only the only uh, point I have left is, uh, it, isn't it strange because you mentioned you mentioned the miracle of reinterpretation, and we can basically go to any other verse in the Quran and say, look what Allah says, and Muslims will go, that's not what it means. It means this completely different thing, right? We go to fight those who do not believe in Allah. Now that is a perfectly clear statement: fight those who don't believe in Allah. We ask Muslims, what's that mean? Oh, it means only fight people who are attacking you in self-defense. And it's just, it's like, okay, so you feel quite comfortable reinterpreting that clear command. Uh, what about this command over here? If your wife gets out of line, you uh, warn her, then banish her to a separate bed, then beat her. What's that mean? Oh, it means, you know, tap her lightly with a, a toothbrush, a muswak. And say, okay, that's not what it says, but you, okay, you're completely willing to interpret that in light of, of other things. And you just go to all these verses. I mean, I mean, think about this. Uh, <laughs> some of the clearest verses in the Quran are verses that are affirming the inspiration, preservation, and authority of our scriptures. 
Surah 7 verse 157 says that Christians and Jews still have the Torah and the gospel. Uh, Surah 18 verse 27 and Surah 6 verse 115 both say that no one can change Allah's words. Notice, no one can change Allah's words. That is a perfectly clear statement. And we ask our Muslim friends, what does Allah mean when he says, no one can change his words? Oh, that means no one can change his decree. Well, wait a minute. We're reading here the context he's talking about. He's talking about the, the revelations that he's delivered in the form of a book. Oh, it's just talking about the Quran. Then. It doesn't say no one can change his words in the Quran. It says no one can change his words. According to Surah 3, verses 3 to 4, are the Torah and the gospel his words? Yes. Okay. 1827, 6115. Can anyone change Allah's words? No. So what does that mean? Oh, it means the Bible, the Bible's been corrupted. Like, wait a minute. Okay, now, now you're willing to reinterpret a bunch of verses which clearly, clearly defend the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Jewish and Christian scriptures because there are a bunch of them. And you're willing to reinterpret every last one of them. But here you have Surah 4, verse 157. And it's the only verse that's deni that, that denies the crucifixion. And it seems to contradict a bunch of other verses. And you can read it in a way where it's not denying the crucifixion. And you say, no, 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 that's the only verse in the Quran you're not allowed to reinterpret. It's like, are you, <laughs> what is this? What is it? It's like, it's like they decide what they want to believe before they go to the Quran. And then they go to the Quran to make the Quran. They interpret, yeah. they just miracle of reinterpretation, whatever we want it. We want to, whatever we want to believe that the Quran is saying, we'll just make Allah say that even if he's not. It's unfortunate because they don't uh, uh, subconsciously they don't think about it that they're committing the same fallacy that they accuse us of, and yet at the same time they're not realizing it, and uh, they corrupt their own book, they corrupt their own interpretation. They're willing to go to uh, uh, you know to such length to where they they're willing to take a group of Quranic verses and make it sound and look like as if it's not saying what it's saying, and the list can go on and on and on. And of course, I mean it's the process of indoctrination by. Uh, decades and even centuries of their own scholar, uh, uh, scholarly work and uh, at school, like I grew up believing in these teachings because the scholar is Ibn Kathir or a Tawari. I mean, they can't be wrong. They, somehow they're, uh, you know, infallible people and you have to believe whatever they said. Yep. And uh, I mean, it, uh, I understand it can be hard to get around that if that's what you've been raised with all your life. But we're 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 here to help. We're here to help Muslims. We're at the end of the day, you, you you may view us as like horrible people, but we're we're trying to help you. Whatever else, whatever else you don't like about us, just keep in mind that when we're exposing Muhammad, or when we're telling you not to not to mindlessly believe everything your sheikhs and imams tell you, um, we we are trying to help. Amen, amen, brother. Well, thank you so much, of course, as always, for taking the time to be with us and also for the list of passages. Hopefully, uh, our Muslim friends will take you up on that and they will go and check those passages. And like you said, uh, once you, as a Muslim, begin to acknowledge the crucifixion of Christ, now you're getting closer to understanding the gospel message because without the crucifixion, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord, our preaching is in vain, technically speaking. I mean, we are just lying to ourselves and 10 apostles went to death for nothing. And uh, Paul went to death for nothing. Even the Paul that Muslims accuse of being a liar, he died for something. I mean, he believed in what he preached because it is the truth. And he listed to us a host of eyewitness accounts and other accounts when he shared the gospel with the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 6, of course. And you will see a whole lot of examples like this from even non-Christian historians who affirmed certain aspects of the gospel message itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you, brother. As always, uh, people are asking, by the way, uh, what's the story behind your hair? Are you doing another boom, boom thing? Or is just this happen to be just laziness? You didn't take time to shave it or whatever the case might be. No, the case is, I, I mentioned this in, in another live stream a while back, but uh, after basically 20 years of marriage, my wife told me she doesn't like short hair. <laughs> Hey, I think they're honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <laughs> being married and yeah. And so she says, uh, now, uh, I'm not entirely convinced she'll like it when it's it's longer. But I'm basically I'm basically gonna uh 
I'm going to grow it long enough to where it's kind of hanging behind the ears. And then she will have seen it at a bunch of different lengths. And I'll say, okay, you pick. And I pointed out in a different live stream. I said, if, if 10, if even 10 years ago, my wife said, I don't like your hair like that. I like it. I'd be like, I don't care. <laughs> it's my hair, right? I like it short because I don't have to comb it. I don't have to do anything. I just get out of the shower and it, it just sticks straight up. And so what's the problem? Uh, whereas now all the stuff my wife has put up with over the years, uh, giving birth to all my kids, putting up with all the death threats and everything else we get, uh, my wife could tell me to like cut off my finger right now. And I, I, I'd, I'd probably do it. <laughs> I'd probably do it for her. So anyway, something like hair, uh, I'm going to grow it. I'm going to, I'm going to grow it out a little bit and then she can pick. I'm hoping she says, you know, I, I think you look like an idiot with longer hair. So why don't you just go ahead and chop it off, chop it back down. Um, but, uh, we'll, we'll see whatever at the end of the day, she's going to call the shots. Well, on that note, happy birthday, my friend. All right. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that we will do this, uh, uh, you know, uh, more often. And, uh, as we've discussed the possibility, even of doing a recorded uh, video series on this topic, it's very important. I agree with you that hopefully our Muslim friends will finally realize that they have been lied to and it's time for them to dig deeper into the truth and take it from there. As always, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. This is Al-Fadi over and out. God bless. Take care.